EGFRs belong to the same receptor family as human epidermal growth factor receptor 2, HER2. It is the target for trastuzumab, Herceptin, a drug mainly used to treat breast cancer. HER2 is overexpressed in certain cancers, especially breast cancers. It is associated with more aggressive disease and decreased survival. Trastuzumab is a monoclonal antibody, MOAB, that binds to HER-2. It is given IV to inhibit the growth of breast cancer cells that overexpress the HER2 protein. Lopatinib, Tycurb, is an oral agent used for breast cancer that overexpresses HER2. Chronic myeloid leukemia, CML, cells make an abnormal active enzyme called BCR-ABL tyrosine kinase. Drugs such as imatinib, Gleevec, that inhibit the enzyme suppress proliferation of CML cells and promote cell death. Angiogenesis inhibitors work by preventing the mechanisms and pathways necessary for vascularization of tumors. Beva Kizumab, Avastin, is a recombinant human MOAB, binds with vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, a compound that stimulates blood vessel growth. When Bevacizumab binds with VEGF, it prevents VEGF from binding with its receptors on vascular endothelial cells and promoting new vessel formation. As a result, further tumor growth is inhibited. Proteasomes are intracellular multi-enzyme complexes that degrade proteins. In cancer cells, proteasome inhibitors, e.g. bortezomib, velcade, promote accumulation of proteins that lead to cell death. Cancer cells can become resistant to targeted therapies. This can occur because the one target changes through mutation and the therapy no longer interacts with it, and two, the tumor finds a new growth pathway and no longer depends on the target. Because of the possibility of resistance, targeted therapies work best in combination or in combination with a chemotherapy drug. Side effects of immunotherapy and targeted therapy. The administration of one type of immunotherapy usually induces the endogenous release of other agents. The release and action of these agents result in systemic immune and inflammatory responses. The toxicities and side effects are related to dose and schedule. Common side effects include flu-like symptoms, including headache, fever, chills, myalgias, fatigue, malaise, weakness, photosensitivity, anorexia, and nausea. Those receiving interferon therapy almost always have flu-like symptoms. Their severity generally decreases over time. Acetaminophen, given every four hours, is prescribed, and large amounts of fluid often reduce the severity of the flu-like syndrome. The patient is often pre-medicated with acetaminophen to try to prevent or decrease the intensity of these symptoms. Tachycardia and orthostatic hypotension are common. IL-2 and MOABs can cause capillary leak syndrome, which can result in pulmonary edema. Other toxic and side effects may involve the CNS, renal and hepatic systems, and cardiovascular system. These effects are found with interferons and IL-2. A wide range of neurologic problems can occur with interferon and IL-2 therapy. The nature and extent of these problems are not yet completely understood. They are frightening to the patient and caregivers. Teach them to observe for neurologic problems, e.g. confusion, memory loss, difficulty making decisions, insomnia. Report their occurrence and institute safety and support measures. MOABs are given by infusions. Patients may have infusion-related symptoms, including fever, chills, urticaria, mucosal congestion, nausea, diarrhea, and myalgias. Skin rashes are common in patients receiving EGFR inhibitors. They manifest generally as erythema and acneiform-like rash that can cover a large part of the upper body. Angiogenesis inhibitors can cause arterial thrombi, hemorrhage, hypertension, impaired wound healing, and proteinuria. Other toxicities of MOABs include hepatotoxicity, bone marrow depression, and CNS effects. Nursing management, immunotherapy, and targeted therapy. 
Some problems experienced by the patient receiving immunotherapy and targeted therapy are different from those seen with more traditional forms of cancer treatment. These effects occur more acutely and are dose limited, e.g. effects resolve when therapy is over. Patients may be hesitant to inform the HCP of intolerable side effects. Some may be afraid to discuss side effects because they may think that the drug will be stopped or they decide to stop the drug because of the side effects. Assess and evaluate the patient's side effects and tolerance. Appropriate proactive nursing care can prevent these problems because you are able to intervene. Capillary leak syndrome and pulmonary edema are problems that require critical care nursing. Bone marrow depression is generally more transient and less severe than that seen with chemotherapy. Fatigue associated with immunotherapy and targeted therapy can be so severe that it is a dose-limiting toxicity. When these agents are combined with chemotherapy, the spectrum of therapy-related effects expands. Nursing interventions for flu-like syndrome include giving acetaminophen before treatment and every four hours after treatment. IV meperidine, or Demerol, has been used to control the severe chills or rigors associated with some agents. Other nursing measures include monitoring vital signs and temperature, planning for periods of rest for the patient, assisting with activities of daily living, ADLs, and monitoring for adequate oral intake. Hormone therapy. Hormones are substances that are made in endocrine glands and function as chemical messengers in the body. The hormones estrogen and progesterone can enhance the growth of some breast cancers. Androgen, testosterone, can enhance the growth of some prostate cancers. When given as a cancer treatment, drugs, hormone therapy, can block the effects of the hormone and stop the growth of cancer cells, table 15.14. Corticosteroids are used in combination with many drug regimens for cancer. They are anti-inflammatory agents that reduce swelling and inflammation, which may be contributing to cancer pain. They may be used with other drugs such as ondansetron and aprepitant to control and prevent nausea and vomiting caused by chemotherapy. In addition to drug manipulation of hormones, surgical interventions, oophorectomy or castration, can be used to remove the effects of the hormone on cancer growth. Hematopoietic growth factors. Hematopoietic growth factors are used to support patients through their cancer treatment, table 15.15. Colony stimulating factors, CSFs, are a family of glycoproteins made by various cells. CSFs stimulate production, maturation, regulation, and activation of cells of the hematologic system. The name of the CSF is based on the specific cell line it affects. Erythropoiesis stimulating agents, ESAs, should be used only when treating anemia specifically caused by chemotherapy. ESA use is avoided in patients receiving chemotherapy with the intent to cure the disease. Their use has raised safety concerns. They can cause potential harm, thromboembolic events, shorter survival, and increase the risk for death in serious cardiovascular events when given to achieve a target hemoglobin of greater than 12 grams per deciliter. Thus, the lowest dose should be used that will gradually increase hemoglobin to the lowest level sufficient to avoid the need for blood transfusion. Monitor the hemoglobin level regularly. Hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. HSCT and peripheral stem cell transplantation, PSCT, are effective life-saving procedures for the treatment of several malignant and non-malignant diseases, table 15.16. Both allow for the safe use of very high doses of chemotherapy agents and or radiation therapy in patients whose tumors have developed resistance, refractory, or did not respond to standard doses of chemotherapy and radiation. Although these procedures are life-saving, patients may have long-term or delayed complications that can affect their quality of life. This therapeutic approach was referred to as bone marrow transplant because the bone marrow was the original source of stem cells when the procedure was first developed. However, advances in harvesting and cryopreservation technologies have opened new pathways to the collection of stem cells from the peripheral blood. Consequently, the terminology has changed. Overall cure rates are steadily increasing. Even when cure is not achieved, transplantation can result in a period of remission. The approach in HSCT is to eradicate diseased tumor cells and or clear the bone marrow of its components to make way for engraftment of the transplanted healthy stem cells. This is done by giving higher than usual dosages of chemotherapy with or without radiation therapy. Life-threatening consequences associated with pancytopenia and other adverse effects can result from this procedure. 
After chemotherapy and radiation therapy are over, healthy stem cells are infused. These healthy stem cells rescue the damaged bone marrow through subsequent proliferation and differentiation of the donated stem cells in the recipient. HSCT is an intensive procedure with many risks. Some patients die from treatment-related complications or from recurrence of the original disease. Because it is highly toxic therapy, the patient must weigh the significant risks for treatment-related death or treatment failure relapse against the hope of cure. Types of hematopoietic stem cell transplants. HSCTs are categorized as allogenic, syngenic, or autologous. The sources of stem cells include the bone marrow, peripheral circulating blood, and umbilical cord blood. In allogenic transplantation, stem cells are acquired from a donor, graft, who, through human leukocyte antigen, HLA, tissue typing, has been determined to be HLA matched to the recipient, host. HLA typing involves testing WBCs to identify genetically inherited antigens common to both donor and recipient that are important in compatibility of transplanted tissue. HLA tissue typing is discussed in Chapter 13. The donor is often a family member. It may be an unrelated donor found through a national or international bone marrow registry, e.g. National Marrow Donor Program. These are known as matched unrelated donor MUD transplants. Increased risks and toxicities may be associated with a MUD. Common indications for allergenic transplant are certain leukemias, multiple myeloma and lymphoma. Syngenic transplantation is a type of allergenic transplant that involves obtaining stem cells from one identical twin and infusing them into the other. Identical twins have identical HLA types and are a perfect match. In autologous transplantation, patients receive their own stem cells back after myeloablative, destroying bone marrow, chemotherapy, figure 15.17. The aim of this approach is purely rescue. It allows patients to receive intensive chemotherapy and or radiation by supporting them with their previously harvested stem cells until their marrow generates blood cells again on its own. Restoration usually takes about four to six weeks. The newer non-myeloablative or reduced intensity transplant uses lower doses of radiation or chemotherapy that result in less toxicity and myelosuppression. HSCT continues to be investigated in managing some solid tumors resistant to treatment. Procedures. Harvest procedures. Hematopoietic stem cells are harvested from a donor for allergenic transplantation or from the recipient for autologous transplantation via two methods. The procedure used for harvesting stem cells for bone marrow is done in the operating room using general or spinal anesthesia. Multiple bone marrow aspirations, usually from the iliac crest, but sometimes from the sternum, are carried out to obtain stem cells. The harvested marrow is processed to strain out bone fragments. The entire bone marrow harvest procedure takes about one to two hours. The patient can be discharged after recovery. Post-harvest, the donor may have pain at the collection site that lasts up to seven days, can be treated with mild analgesics. The donor's body will replenish the removed bone marrow in a few weeks. In the other procedure, peripheral stem cell transplants are obtained from the peripheral blood in an outpatient procedure. It is done using cell separator equipment that automatically separates the stem cells from the blood circulating through the machine and returns the remaining blood components to the donor. The process averages about two to four hours. Sometimes it takes longer depending on donor factors and the quality of the venous access. Often it takes more than one procedure to obtain enough stem cells because the blood has fewer stem cells than the bone marrow. Mobilization of stem cells from the bone marrow into the peripheral blood can be achieved with chemotherapy and or hematopoietic growth factors. To increase stem cell production for collection, common growth factors that are used are granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, GMCSF, and granulate colony stimulating factor, GCSF. See table 15.15. When patients are given growth factors for mobilization, stem cells are harvested four or five days after growth factor injections. After collection, the marrow or peripheral stem cells are used immediately or bagged with preservative for cryopreservation and storage until they are needed. Since they come from the patient, autologous stem cells are sometimes treated, purged, to remove undetected cancer cells. Many different pharmacologic, immunologic, physical, and chemical agents are used for this purpose. 
Umbilical cord blood is rich in hematopoietic stem cells. Successful allergenic transplants have been done using this source. Cord blood can be HLA typed and cryo preserved. A disadvantage of cord blood is the possibility of insufficient numbers of stem cells to allow transplant to adults. Considerable research is currently ongoing to define the optimal use of this technology. Preparative regimens and stem cell infusions. Patients receive myeloablative dosages of chemotherapy with or without adjunctive radiation to treat the underlying disease. Total body irradiation, TBI, can be used for immunosuppression to treat the disease. These preparative therapies are known as conditioning regimen. Stem cell infusions are given IV. They can be injected via the slow bolus method or infused much like a blood transfusion using tubing without a filter. The infused stem cells reconstitute the bone marrow elements, rescuing the recipient's hematopoietic system. It usually takes two to four weeks for the transplanted marrow to start making hematopoietic blood cells. During this period, the patient has pancytopenia. The patient must be protected from exposure to infectious agents and supported with electrolyte supplements, nutrition, and blood component transfusions as needed to maintain adequate levels of circulating RBCs and platelets. Complications. Bacterial, viral, and fungal infections are common after HSCT. Prophylactic therapies are used to reduce their incidence. A potentially serious complication of allergenic transplant is graft-versus-host disease. This occurs when the T-cells from the donated marrow graft recognize the recipient host as foreign and begin to attack certain organs, such as the skin, liver, and GI tract. Graft-versus-host disease is discussed in Chapter 13. The occurrence and severity of post-transplant complications depend on the drugs used. Some are more toxic than others. And the stem cell source. Because stem cells in the peripheral blood are more mature than those harvested from the marrow, the hematologic recovery period in PSCT is shorter and fewer, less severe complications are seen. Gene therapy. Gene therapy is an experimental therapy that involves introducing genetic material into a person's cells to fight disease. At this time, the use of gene therapy is investigational. Gene therapy is discussed in Chapter 12. Complications of cancer. The patient may develop complications related to the continual growth of the cancer into normal tissue or to the side effects of treatment. Nutritional problems. Malnutrition. The patient with cancer may have protein and calorie malnutrition characterized by fat and muscle depletion. The assessment of malnutrition is discussed in Chapter 39. Soft, non-irritating, high-protein and high-calorie food should be eaten throughout the day. Foods suggested for increasing the protein intake are shown in Table 15.17. High calorie foods that provide energy and minimize weight loss are shown in Table 15.18. Foods in a high calorie, high protein diet are outlined in Table 39.10. Teach the patient to avoid extremes of temperatures, tobacco, alcohol, spicy or rough foods, and other irritants. Encourage nutritional supplements, e.g., Ensure, as an adjunct to meals and fluid intake. Weigh the patient at least twice each week to monitor for weight loss. Suggest a referral for nutritional counseling to the patient or HCP as soon as a 5% weight loss is noted or if the patient has the potential for protein and calorie malnutrition. Monitor albumin and pre-albumin levels. Once a 10-pound, 4.5-kilogram weight loss occurs, it may be hard to maintain the patient's nutritional status. Teach the patient to use nutritional supplements in place of milk when cooking or baking. Foods to which nutritional supplements can be easily added include scrambled eggs, pudding, custard, mashed potatoes, cereal, and cream sauces. Packages of instant breakfast can be used as indicated or sprinkled on cereals, desserts, and casseroles. Caregivers are an integral part of the healthcare team. As symptom severity increases, the caregiver's role in helping the patient eat becomes increasingly critical. If the malnutrition cannot be treated with dietary intake, it may be necessary to use enteral or paraenteral nutrition. Enteral and parenteral nutrition are discussed in Chapter 39. Altered taste sensation, dysgeusia. Cancer cells may release substances that stimulate the bitter taste buds. The patient may have changes in the sweet, sour, and salty taste sensations. Meat may taste bitter or bland. We do not know the cause of these taste changes. Teach patients with altered taste problems to avoid foods that they dislike. Often, the patient may feel compelled to eat certain foods that are believed to be beneficial. 
Tell the patient to try different ways to mask the taste changes. Some find stronger seasoning and spices effective. Others find it better to avoid strong flavors and eat more bland foods. Avoid strong smells. Drinking more water with food. Oral care before eating. Eating smaller amounts more often. And using plastic utensils may help. Cancer cachexia. Cancer cachexia, wasting syndrome, is a complex multifactorial syndrome characterized by anorexia and or unintended loss of weight and appetite. It is accompanied by generalized tissue wasting, skeletal muscle atrophy, immune dysfunction, and metabolic problems. Weight loss cannot be reversed nutritionally. Patients with upper GI and pancreatic cancers are prone to cachexia. As cancer progresses, cachexia can affect many cancer patients. It is associated with increased morbidity. The best management of cancer cachexia is to effectively treat the cancer. Fortunately, that is not a realistic goal for patients with advanced cancer. A second option is to increase nutritional intake, but this does not completely reverse the wasting associated with cachexia. A third option is to use magesterol acetate, megase. It is a synthetic form of the hormone progesterone, which stimulates appetite in patients with cachexia. Infection. Infection is a leading cause of death in the patient with cancer. The usual sites of infection include the lungs, the use system, mouth, rectum, peritoneal cavity, and blood, septicemia. Infection occurs because of the ulceration and necrosis caused by the tumor. The tumor compressing vital organs and neutropenia from the cancer or cancer treatment. Teach patients at risk for neutropenia to call their HCP if they have a temperature of 100.4, 38 Celsius or greater. Assessment often includes signs and symptoms of fever, Determination of possible causes, e.g. sinus, mucous membranes, respiratory, GI, urinary, sites of any tubes or lines, and CBC. Many patients are neutropenic when an infection develops. In these persons, infection may cause significant morbidity. It may be rapidly fatal if not treated promptly. The classic manifestations of infection are often subtle or absent in a patient with neutropenia and a depressed immune system. Neutropenia was discussed earlier in this chapter on page 248. It's also discussed in chapter 30. Oncologic emergencies. Oncologic emergencies are life-threatening emergencies that can occur because of cancer or cancer treatment. These emergencies can be obstructive, metabolic, or infiltrative, table 15.9. Obstructive emergencies. Obstructive emergencies are mainly caused by tumor obstruction of an organ or blood vessel. They include superior vena cava syndrome, figure 15.8, Spinal cord compression syndrome, third space syndrome, and intestinal obstruction. Metabolic emergencies. Metabolic emergencies are caused by the production of ectopic hormones directly from the tumor or from metabolic problems caused by the cancer or cancer treatment. Ectopic hormones arise from tissues that do not normally make these hormones. Cancer cells return to a more embryonic form, thus allowing the cell's stored potential to become evident. Metabolic emergencies include syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, chapter 49, hypercalcemia, chapter 16, tumor lysis syndrome, septic shock, chapter 66, and disseminated intravascular coagulation, chapter 30. Infiltrative emergencies. Infiltrative emergencies occur when cancer infiltrates major organs or from cancer treatment. Most common infiltrative emergencies are cardiac tamponade and carotid artery rupture. Cancer pain. Moderate to severe pain occurs in around 50% of patients who are receiving active treatment for their cancer and in 80% to 90% of patients with advanced cancer. What is concerning is that these statistics have not changed in the past 30 years. Under treatment of cancer pain is common. It causes needless suffering, decreases quality of life, and increases the burden on caregivers. Pain assessment. Inadequate pain assessment is the single greatest barrier to effective pain management. Data such as vital signs and patient behaviors are not reliable indicators of pain, especially long-standing chronic pain. It's important to know if pain is persistent or episodic, positional, or breakthrough pain. It is essential that a comprehensive pain assessment include a detailed history to elicit the characteristics of pain. This includes the quality, location, intensity, duration, and precipitating and alleviating factors. Distinguishing between types of pain, e.g. visceral, bone, neuropathic, is important in developing an effective pain management plan. Assess pain on an ongoing basis to determine the effectiveness of the treatment plan. Obtain data and document at regular intervals the location and intensity of the pain, what it feels like, and how it is relieved. Assess change in pain, e.g. a change in the intensity character worsening or location of pain, to determine the cause, e.g. progression of disease. Always believe the patient's report. 
and accept it as the primary source of assessment data. Table 15.20 presents assessment questions that may facilitate data collection. Have patients keep a pain management diary. Pain management. Pain management for the cancer patient must address both persistent and breakthrough components of pain if they are present. Adjuvant therapies need to be delivered specific to the type of or nature of the pain. Drug therapy, including NSAIDs, e.g. ibuprofen, opioids, e.g. morphine, and adjuvant pain medications should be used and selected based on the character and or cause of the pain. Opioids normally are prescribed for the treatment of moderate to severe cancer pain. Drug dosages are adjusted to control pain with the fewest side effects. Analgesic medications, e.g. morphine, fentanyl, should be given on a regular schedule around the clock, with more doses available as needed for breakthrough pain. In general, oral administration is preferred. Other routes, e.g. transdermal, transmucosal, are options. Treatment plans should be developed that balance analgesia and side effects to maintain optimal functional status. It is important for you to pay attention to common side effects of pain medications, e.g. constipation, to ensure the patient's well-being and adherence with the pain management program. NSAIDs often serve as helpful adjuncts to opioid therapy, especially for bone pain. Antidepressant and anti-seizure drugs may be helpful in managing neuropathic pain, which is often resistant to opioids. A lot of tables and charts here in the next two pages. Radioactive drugs, e.g. Samarium-153, may help patients with diffuse bone pain, especially if no further chemotherapy is planned. Patients may have an initial pain flare for administration. Nerve blocks, or epidural or intrathecal analgesia, may be used to treat patients with unrelieved pain or to minimize the use of opioids. Discuss the goals of analgesic therapy with patients, especially those needing large or chronic doses of opioids. You need to assess the patient for risk factors for opioid misuse. Patient teaching to clarify myths and misconceptions and reassure patients and caregivers that cancer pain can be effectively relieved. Fear of addiction is not warranted. However, it must be addressed as part of patient teaching. It is a significant barrier for patients and nurses in appropriate pain management. Stress that addiction and tolerance are not problems associated with effective cancer pain management. Non-drug interventions, including relaxation therapy and imagery, can be effectively used to manage pain. See Chapter 6. Other strategies to relieve pain are discussed in Chapter 8. Coping with cancer and treatment. You have a key role in assisting patients in coping with the psychosocial issues associated with cancer and cancer treatment. The patient may have a variety of concerns, including fears of dependency, loss of control, family and relationship stress, financial burden, and fear of death. Anxiety and fear may occur throughout the cancer continuum, including at diagnosis, during or after treatment, and in association with the long-term follow-up. Repetitive office visits or hospitalizations, continuing medications, and frequent laboratory testing force the patient to confront the cancer on a daily basis. Treatment-related uncertainties and fears are often most evident at the beginning of therapy. However, anxiety and fear may be present throughout treatment and when therapy is completed, e.g. fear of recurrence, less available support. Adaptation and coping with a cancer diagnosis may be influenced by a variety of patient factors. These include demographics, prior coping skills and strategies, social support, and religious and spiritual beliefs. Table 15.21. You are in a key position to assess the patient's and caregiver's responses and support positive coping strategies. To promote effective coping and to support them during the various stages of cancer, you should be available and continue to be available, especially during difficult times. Exhibit a caring attitude. Listen actively to fears and concerns. Help provide relief from distressing symptoms. Provide accurate, essential information about cancer and cancer care. Help establish realistic expectations about what the patient will experience. Maintain a relationship based on trust and confidence. Be open, honest, and caring in the approach. Use touch to show caring. A squeeze of the hand or a hug may at times be more effective than words. Help the patient in setting realistic, reachable, short-term and long-term goals. Help the patient maintain usual lifestyle patterns. Maintain hope, which is the key to effective cancer care. Hope varies depending on the patient's status. Hope that the symptoms are not serious. Hope that the treatment is curative. Hope for independence. Hope for a relief of pain. Hope for a longer life. Hope to achieve meaningful goals or hope for a peaceful death. Hope provides control over what is current and is the basis of a positive attitude toward cancer and cancer care. Tell patients that they will be followed and reassure them that support is ongoing. Give information and support to help minimize the negative impact of cancer treatment on quality of life. Patient teaching and symptom management help patients to self-manage their illness, e.g. adjusting treatment schedules to allow patients to work when possible, making referrals to support groups. 
Work with the oncology nurse navigators who serve as the liaison between the patient and members of the interprofessional care team. Arrange for patients to meet with people who have successfully completed therapy. This can increase their hopefulness and confidence. Make regular, supportive telephone contacts between office visits. Assist with planning for transportation, nutrition, and emotional support. Do not forget the caregivers. They need education and support throughout the trajectory of diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up. Patients and caregivers may benefit from a variety of psychosocial interventions. These include supportive listening, stress management techniques, individual or group counseling, and cognitive behavioral therapy. Assess the psychosocial concerns and emotional responses of patients, caregivers, and families so you can connect them with appropriate supportive care resources. Use the available resources in the community, such as the ACS, Cancer Lifeline, churches, and other community resources. Gerontologic considerations, cancer. Cancer is usually a disease of aging, with 78% of cancers occurring in people 55 years or older. Cancer mortality rates are exceedingly high in older adults. Of all deaths due to cancer, 70% occur in those over age 65. This is especially important since the normal lifespan is increasing in the proportion of the population who is older than 65 years is increasing. Manifestations of cancer in older adults may be mistakenly attributed to age-related changes and ignored by the person. Older adults are especially at risk for complications of both cancer and cancer treatment. This is due to their decline in physiologic functioning, social and emotional resources, and cognitive function. The older adult's functional status should be taken into consideration when developing a treatment plan. Age alone is not a good predictor of tolerance or response to treatment. Advances in cancer treatments are making cancer therapies beneficial to more older adults, including those with suboptimal health. Assess the patient at the time of diagnosis to identify important issues that may affect decisions about treatment options. Issues to assess include projected life expectancy, estimate of morbidity from cancer, comorbidities that would affect treatment, and patient decision-making capacity and wishes. Some important questions to consider when an older adult is diagnosed with cancer include, will the treatment provide more benefits than harm? Will they be able to tolerate the treatment safely? Is there a need to treat comorbidities or nutritional or functional status before we start treatment? What are the patient's preferences and wishes? Cancer survivorship. As the overall death rate from cancer decreases, number of cancer survivors continues to increase. It is estimated there are currently more than 14.5 million cancer survivors in the United States. Some of these persons are cancer-free. Others still have evidence of cancer and may be receiving treatment. The increase in survivorship is attributed to the aging and growth of the population and improvements in early detection and treatment. Survival statistics vary by the type and stage of cancer. The rapid increase in cancer survivors has been accompanied by a greater awareness of long-term health and quality of life issues that a cancer diagnosis imposes. Cancer survivors have a variety of long-term and late effects after treatment. You need to be aware of the effects of the various treatments so that you can teach patients and their caregivers. The impact of cancer and its treatment confers greater risk for non-cancer related death and comorbidities, e.g. heart disease, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, endocrine dysfunction, osteoporosis. Among cancer survivors, cancer survivors may continue to have symptoms or functional impairment related to treatment for years after treatment. The impact of a cancer diagnosis can affect many aspects of a patient's life. Cancer survivors often report financial, vocational, marital, and spiritual concerns long after treatment is over. Psychosocial and emotional issues can play a profound role in the patient's life after cancer. Many find living in uncertainty challenging. Some patients may wish to return to their normal lives as soon as possible. They may not go to scheduled follow-up appointments. Others become cancer advocates or active members of a cancer support group. Still others allow their lives to revolve around the cancer and may even resist giving up the illness role. Tips to help cancer survivors are described in Table 15.22. Connecting cancer survivors to online support and resources is a strategy to enhance positive health outcomes, Table 15.23. Culturally competent care, cancer. Cancer incidence and death rates are disproportionately higher in blacks than in whites and other minority groups. Although overall racial disparities in cancer death rates have been declining, Death rates continue to be higher among blacks and whites. Blacks are more likely to have later stage disease at the time of diagnosis than whites. Differences in survival rates for cancer are attributed to a combination of factors. These include poverty, difficult access to and poor quality of healthcare, more comorbid conditions, and differences in tumor biology. 
Disparities in cancer care exist throughout the continuum from cancer prevention and screening to end-of-life care at survivorship. The disparity in prevention and screening results in cancer being in advanced stages at the time of diagnosis. Culturally competent care in oncology is needed to meet the needs of diverse groups. It involves awareness of personal background, how culture affects care delivery, and how to adapt to meet cultural needs. Nurses need to actively seek to understand cultural differences to meet the patient's needs. Culture is discussed in Chapter 2. Culturally competent care related to specific cancers is in the chapters in which the cancer is discussed.